one thing that the ATF is authorized to do is disband. You know, the right to bear arms is because that's the last form of defense against tyranny. Not to hunt, it's to protect yourself from the police. Not only no gun control, but you know, we're gonna destroy the whole concept because the internet's gonna serve guns. And we want our rights, and by God, we're gonna keep them. Come hell or high water. The E Militia Podcast, Episode 63 Phoenix Ammunition, a very based conversation. Enjoy, fuckers. Hello and welcome to the E-Militia Podcast. I'm BR and today I'm joined by my co-hosts Mel, aka Small Crimes, and Rezzy, aka Resurrecting Freedom. And our special guest today is Phoenix Ammunition, or Justin, the owner of Phoenix Ammunition, a self-described meme company that sometimes makes ammunition, and we love to see it. The uh, the, the Twitter timeline is uh, a good place to be right now, uh, even in the midst of an ammo shortage. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us, man. Hey, no problem. My pleasure to be here. Uh, so, I first question I got to ask is what has what has prompted you um, to be so vocal on Twitter as a as an ammunition company and to to be very unapologetic about your uh, your stances, your principles, and you know what what you believe is right in this current era of well lockdowns and statism. Sure. Well. Um... You know, it's kind of a multi-point process, I suppose. Um, we're a small company, and when we got started back before the 2016 election, we were the new kids on the block, so to speak. And at the time, uh, we were kind of late to the game. Um, you know, there was a, a big ammo shortage during the Obama presidency after the Sandy Hook shooting, uh, similar to what we're seeing now, but not not quite as bad. Um, but we were, as I said, sort of late to the game. We didn't get into this business until uh, October of 2016. And there were a lot of other reloading companies who had um, gotten their foothold in the market many years before us. And and there were several here in our state as well. So we knew that we kind of had to approach things a bit differently. We started off like everyone else, selling at gun shows and trying to get a customer base, um, trying to figure out what niche we could potentially fill. And what I noticed is most of the p- companies in this industry didn't really have much of a social media presence aside from you know, managed Instagram and Twitter accounts that are run by a media management company for the big guys like you know the Trigicons of the world or um, Palmetto State Armory, that kind of thing. So I knew that in order to make any ground there, we had to be a little bit different. And so I said, well, you know, I personally don't really have any social media, but I like to argue and I, I like to tell people <laughs> what I think. And um, I like the challenge of trying to convince people that, you know, what 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 I might think or how I might see the world isn't isn't so crazy. So I just... I, I tried to, to start a little bit more corporate, I would say, um, a little holding a, a few things back. But over the years, as we got more into competitive shooting and, you know, there's a lot of trash talking in that business. And then just over the years of getting to know other companies and, and kind of seeing how they approach things. And, and there's so much in there's so much to gun culture and to the gun community uh, there's a lot of things to be proud of, but there's also a lot of things to make fun of and a lot of things that I personally find are really stupid about the industry that I wish weren't here. So what better way to, to um, bring those things to the focus than to try to do that through uh, social media? I love it. I mean, it's it's ballsy as hell to do it directly. It's not like, you know, you have Phoenix Ammunition and then, and then your CEO account where you're like, you know, shit posting on everyone. But it's, it's just direct. This is my brand and this is what I think. And I mean, it's one of those things. It's a complete gamble, but it's clearly gotten you a ton of respect in the community from it's everyone amazing. from 3D print, print types to, you know, just gun rights extremists. I mean, you're, even in your bio, you describe yourself as, as a gun rights extremist. Sure. And, you know, part of that is about seeing, again, niches within the market and trying to figure out, all right, well, who are the people that aren't really getting much of a voice? And, you know, how do we how do we bring things even back to the middle? So when I say I'm a gun rights extremist, that's true. I I would say that 
how I feel about things are are probably not inclusive of the the vast or not the vast majority, but the the majority of the community. Let's say, but there has to be room for that because if you have an entire community of say moderates uh, or people who lean toward gun control but just don't really realize it, then eventually you start getting pulled toward the middle and all the way toward the left end of the spectrum. And and that's where we're losing the, the culture battle in a lot of ways as well. You know, um, it's not all that crazy to see somebody on the extreme left, um, Antifa types or these real radical socialists, you know, people setting up guillotines out front of Jeff Bezos's house. You know, like we don't think of that as being extreme anymore. But the minute that you say, hey, you know, uh, I don't think that we should prohibit convicted felons who are released from prison from owning a firearm if they did their time and they've served uh, what our society has said is the appropriate punishment, then why either we either we think they're too dangerous to own a gun and therefore they shouldn't be let out of prison or we've decided that they've paid their penance and they can rejoin society as a full member and that they have the right to defend themselves in the same way that everybody else does. But if you say something now, saying it like that, you might hear people say, "Okay, well, I agree with that. But if you start with the premise of I think convicted felons should be able to own a gun, you get this look at people like you just exposed yourself in public or something. So it it's just very different from and and then they'll turn on MSNBC and, and see a Wendy's on fire. And it's like, oh, that's totally justified. That's no big deal. They were just angry. They were expressing themselves. And so there has to be some amount of, uh, quote, extremism within our community where you have people that are going to say, look, we just I'm not going to accept any more infringements. Okay, that's good. But I also want to roll back all the infringements that are already there. So once we started playing into that market, that, that of course, leads you to the 3D printed gun community, guys that are developing new types of, of ammunition and you know, trying to figure out ways to work within the confines of gun laws, but actually get what they want. Um, you know, pistol braces, obviously, were kind of the first iteration of that in the community. So if we can... It, 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 it's a it's a market segment for sure, but it's a gigantic market segment. And we're we're happy. Uh, what's that line from uh, War Dogs? You know, there's a huge pie and um, uh, we're happy to eat the crumbs like I love the crumbs. The crumbs feed my family. The crumbs feed our eight employees. And I've got no interest in trying to to gobble down the whole pie, which is where all these corporate companies really lose their spine, I think, over time. Oh, absolutely. Like when you, when you get to a place, yeah, we, we, when you get to a place where a gun, like a, any, anyone who works in the gun industry is not 110% behind, you know, the core rights, the natural right to own, own, own uh, firearms, whatever you deem necessary for your safety. It's, it's like, why, why are you here? You're just, you're just making money. You're not here to, for longevity. You're here for the the bonuses and the, you know, all the corporate shit, not the actual community that you're, you know, you're targeting. Sure. And, working with. and you know, unfortunately, that's the majority of the companies as they get bigger, you get, uh, you know, you've got middle managers, you've got HR departments, and all of a sudden, that message that maybe was there when the company got started starts to get diluted and diluted and you know, original management or ownership retires and their kids take over and, you know, they they tend to ruin companies within a couple of generations, no matter what company it is. But in the gun community in particular, you know, they get a couple of good government contracts. They get a bunch of money and they get a bunch of guarantees for future government contracts. And the reality is most of these companies, yeah, they'd be affected to a degree if uh, the civilian market for firearms and ammunition um, took a huge hit in the United States, you know, we, 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 if we saw a bunch of bans or what have you. But it, under no circumstances is the federal government going to allow, you know, the, the, the big four, uh, Remington, Winchester, CCI, Federal, or, you know, Glock or Colt, they're, they're not, they're not going to allow those companies to go out of business. They'll feed them enough government contracts and guaranteed money to keep them alive. Um, it's people like us that will suffer because, this is our core market. And, and we just kind of looked around and said, all right, well, these companies are all 
benefiting off the civilian market, but it doesn't really seem like there are many companies that are solely focused on it. So let's yeah. do that. Yeah, I mean, th- those big companies have been in bed with government so long, they're family. It's like, there's no separating them at this point. And exactly. for anyone who thinks that they really give a rat's ass about the Second Amendment when they have just no, they, they, government contracts. <laughs> they, they can't afford to, is the truth, because... You know, they look at their shareholder price and they say, well, I can't say anything too out of bounds, because if we do, uh, we risk, you know, having some report written about us in The Wall Street Journal or some bullshit. And that's just <laughs> never going to be a problem for me. And I'm I'm fine with that. It, it, it's, you know, I'm living the dream, as they say. Uh, yes. Yeah, speaking of government contracts, uh, you guys. Uh, went kind of viral saying that you will not supply police departments with ammo. Did you give yes. up government contracts for that? So um, we have done a small number of police. We've worked with a number of police departments over the years. Um, truth be told, and, and those are all direct with a municipality, some city or some township. Um, and most of those were a situation where we got in touch with them, they got in touch with us. There's only been maybe one or two where we actually had to go through a formal bidding process that was managed by the state. And that's what I would think of as like a real government contract. But um, yeah, basically there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, And and truth be told, you know, uh, it was never a big part of of our revenue stream anyway, maybe one to 2% at most. So it wasn't like it was a huge amount of money. Police departments don't really order that much ammo. Uh, the, the sad they truth, don't train. <laughs> yeah, they don't train. The sad truth of the matter is, if you've got a department with 100 officers and they shoot their guns twice a year, you know you're talking about uh, a, a 10,000 round order. Like, okay, well, I've got guys <laughs> who order more than that a month because they're competitive shooters and they go through a thousand rounds a weekend, and not including what they use to practice. So, but yeah, so basically, when things started to get real crazy. And we realized that we had way more retail customers than we could possibly service. What sense does it make for us as a company to sell ammo at wholesale prices to police departments who want to pay you nothing and they want to make you wait 30 days to get paid? uh, Or I could just sell it to the retail market or to some gun range who really needs it to fill their lanes because that's how gun ranges make money. So we just said, okay, that's going to be our last priority. Uh, Then, as we got through the pandemic and, um, you know, we were adamant that we weren't going to be wearing masks inside of our facility. Uh, I gave my employees the option on day one. They said, this is ridiculous. We're not doing that. Um, And I I agreed with them. I, you know, gave them the option, but we made a decision that it just wasn't something that we needed to do that was important. And so then as time went on, um, we started to get harassed a little bit and, we should give um, a little bit of context. You guys are in Michigan, right? That's correct. Yes. You, you have one of the, the Lord, big bad three. Yeah. God, Queen, Gretchen, Whitmer, uh, <laughs> on her throne. Yeah. So um, that it's kind of a long story. Long story short, uh, we, we had gotten some attention from a local uh, liberal, liberal rag magazine that was trying to call us out for not wearing masks in our facility. Uh, so we got a couple of warning letters from the health department. And then we had a police officer, no white police officer come in here because of a um, anonymous complaint that somebody made. And while he was there taking the report, a customer came in to pick up the order that he had placed online. And I handed him his order without having a mask on. So the police officer included that in his police report and sent that to the health department, which resulted in us getting fined a thousand dollars. If he had not put that in the report, it would never have happened. So it's it's his responsibility. He had no reason that he had to do that, uh, but he chose to do it. So as a result, I just said, look, I was already teetering on that decision anyway, watching uh, businesses getting, you know, there was that Max pub in uh, Brooklyn where they had the freaking New York State Police surrounding the, the place, um, not, not letting him serve drinks and all this nonsense. So. I was already borderline, um, but after that, I just said, I'm done Uh, until you guys get your shit together. um, You know, you're going to find me a thousand bucks. But if uh, some Antifa guy comes and throws a a block through my window and lights my business on fire tonight, you guys aren't going to do shit. So why why am I supporting you? Why am I doing anything for you 
if I know full well that you're not going to do anything for me. So I, I'm just not into unilateral relationships. <laughs> No, absolutely. And that's that's the way it should be. I mean, more and more, we're unfortunately realizing the, these entities haven't been doing anything for us. And, you know, they get they get nice little exceptions to the things that we have to suffer from as gun owners. I mean, you you see any any cop in a band state and guess what? They can have all the mags they want, whatever rifle they want. There's there's no limitation on them. And so the, these guys, you know, we've as a community, the you know gun rights community has been so pro cop for so long, and it's just not people. People are realizing it's not worth it anymore. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I I think that's one of the best things that can possibly come out of this pandemic is for conservatives in particular to realize that you know uh, if you have a "Don't Tread on Me" and a "Back the Blue" sticker on your car. It's like that meme where the guy can't decide which button to press. Like, guys, you know, um, the fact of the matter is, yes, Congress passes laws. Uh, the president signs them. But police have the ability to nullify those through lack of enforcement. And they do it all the time. Everybody listening to this podcast has had a situation where they got pulled over and they got let off with a warning. That police officer did not enforce the law that he was supposed to when he did that. Now, if you live in New York and you get pulled over by a cop and you, you know, you're a freaking dentist, you go to church every weekend, you've got nothing on your record, but, uh, you know, you got attacked one time walking to your local bodega. So you decided to buy yourself, uh, you know, a Glock 19 and keep it in your jacket pocket. You're going to fucking prison. Okay. You're not oh, yeah. just going to the county lockup and having to pay a fine and get some community service. You know, they put Plaxico Burris in jail. Okay. Even the celebrities aren't getting out of uh, having a firearm in those areas. So, you know, this idea that we have to blindly support police officers for when, when in reality, they are the ones in charge of enforcing these unconstitutional laws, you know, they could decide not to do that. And, uh, that's the decision that they've made. And so it's, it, you know, hard for me to feel bad about making a decision on, on my own. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, officer Dick just, you know, watching you uh, serve a customer and he decides at his discretion to write it in like, yeah, thanks buddy. Exactly. Right. <laughs> really put, right. putting on his, uh, you know, support in the constitution cap right there. Uh, and you all love that defense. Um, you know, they, oh, they, they, they make an oath to the constitution. You're like, okay. How many, how many forget that, you know, in one ear, out the other? Yeah, exactly. If you indeed made an oath to the Constitution, uh, I would say you're right. And have you read the thing? Because you can't, <laughs> you can't use that to argue that you should be enforcing a, uncon a blatantly unconstitutional gun law. It just, it's, it's just double speak. And, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's unfortunate, but, you know, I think, I think those, I think that, and I think they're learning. Like, I, I think there are, I talk to a lot of police officers. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. I teach at a local academy one day a week. There's a lot of law enforcement there. And I talk to a lot of cops and I got to tell you, there's a lot of guys that are sitting in their patrol car, kind of phoning it in day after day, not really doing a whole lot of enforcement. And they're just waiting. I mean, every day they tell me how many days left until, uh, their you know pension is fully vested so it's uh it'll be an interesting next couple of years to be sure yeah yeah you, you hear that all over people being just disenfranchised with the role believing in it less and less it's it's a it's an interesting time <laughs> i i know we hear that far too often but yeah things like that changing our society is going to be a period of transition whatever that may look like um so something I wanted to ask or talk about was uh, the first thing that pops up when you go to order some ammo on your site. Yes. And uh, that, that's asking you who you voted for or if you voted for Biden, rather. I love it. <laughs> it's, uh, and and the, the entitled backlash you got for that on Twitter was <laughs> unexpected because all of a sudden everyone... Well, I, I won't say everyone, but a lot of people, the, the ones who have at least two brain cells to rub together, realized last year, oh, and speaking of police, 
um, I can't particularly rely on these people anymore to uh, to come and rescue me. Maybe I, I probably never could, but people came to the, the harsh realization, you know, if someone lights their uh, their, their bougie gentrified apartment on fire and <laughs> comes in to take their shit, um, the only person to defend themselves is themselves. And so uh, they, you know, of course, went ahead and voted Orange Man out anyway. And uh, we have the, the the great hero Biden and Kamala in office now. And uh, so, so these people are new gun owners. And, you know, they're, they're struggling for ammunition like anyone else. They come to your site and lo and behold, oh, I voted for Biden. I can't, I'm not allowed in. <laughs> what, what was the... Uh, what what were the initial reactions to that that were like outraged? How how entitled were these people? Yeah, so um, I had put a little note. We have a checkbox in the website that just said it, it makes sure that people understand there's a little bit of a lead time and to be patient with us. So I, I had that checkbox up on the site for a bit, and uh, we did a big sale one day, and I this woman calls and she says I'd like to. You know, I'm trying to check out on your website, but it won't let me. I have to check this box that asks if I voted for Biden. Um, I don't understand. And I, I said, well, I, what's there to not I'm like, what are you what are you confused with? It's pretty simple. And she said, well, I did vote for him. So I said, OK, well, this is why. Like, this is why we're asking the question. Like, have you read Joe Biden's gun control plan? Oh, yeah, I know about that. I said, <laughs> OK, but but you're here to buy ammo. Like, explain you know, what, what, what do you own? And she said, I have a Glock 19. I said, Oh, me too. Well, that's got a 15 round magazine. You know, that Biden wants to ban that. And she said, yeah, okay, well I'm fine with only 10 rounds. So I just said, okay, why there's nothing I can do for you. Um, if you don't get it, then I, I, we're not the company for you. So she hung up and then she called back later and we talked for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And I did my best to convince her, but it, it just wasn't going anywhere. And that's when I realized, look, you know, the, part of the problem with the gun community is there are a certain number of people who think that we it's our duty or our, our obligation to reach out to the other side and try to include them in the conversation. I agree with that only to the extent that uh, I will talk to anybody who is willing to listen to me, but I'm not willing to compromise on my principles and I'm not going to get stuck in an endless debate with people who, who don't understand what they're talking about. I'm an expert in this. I'm a subject matter expert. I have no problem saying that. And if somebody wants to argue with me and who is not a subject matter expert in this particular topic, then I'm going to take their opinion with a certain amount of hilarity. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, we yes, we want to increase the size of the gun community. But what's what's also important is not to dilute the, the yes. values of the community and the importance behind what we're doing. And that's what I could see rapidly. It's like, yeah, we got all these great new gun owners, but none of them know what the deal is. None of them understand what they voted for. None of them understand even what they've got and how the laws that Biden wants to pass will affect what they got. So um, maybe we can try to do some like education here. So that's when I added the splash page on the site. And if you click yes, the site actually redirects you to joebiden.com slash gun safety. So it's not as if we're telling them, hey, you're a fucking loser. Yeah, uh, you're an idiot. What we're saying is, look, <laughs> y- you know, this is this is why I don't want your business. I want you to read what you voted for. And I want you to understand that. And if you read that and you decide, you know what, I'm good with everything on this page, then truly, I don't want your money because <laughs> no amount of your money is going to help me sleep better at night. And I, I don't want to feel indebted to you. I don't want you to feel like you've been tricked by me. So um, there's plenty of companies that are are saying who they want to do business with and who they don't want to do business with on the left. Um, maybe I should do that on the right. And you know what? If they buy, if, if, if they click yes and they go to Biden's website and they read it and they go, oh, I'm going to screw this guy and I'll, I'll use Google incognito and answer no this time and I'll trick him and order the ammo anyway. It's like, okay, bro, I've got your fucking dollars in my pocket now. So, I mean, who are you fooling? Like, you know, I, big deal. Uh, you fool, you sure fooled me. Like, okay. So it's really a win-win situation. And, you know, the blowback we got was very small. 99% of it was people that were never going to buy from us anyway. You know, oh, yeah. 
yeah, couple definitely. of guys in the gun community who who think that they're the people who speak for the whole gun community that wanted to make a thing of it. But I think they were soundly rejected by just about everybody. And okay. if, if they think that their little cadre of friends uh, and, and supporters is representative of, you know, our customer base or even the community as a whole, I think they're wrong. And I think that's been borne out. Um, we've never done better. We've never had more exposure. We've never had um, more interaction between our, our customers and our company. Uh, so I, I think it's, I, I think it's, uh, you know, points to it being a, a good decision overall. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, we can see that you guys are real people with real principles. You're not just some, you know, like, like, uh, Heckler and Koch a, a long time back, I got in a little spat with their, uh, their social media guy for, for whatever reason it started. I, um, I talked to them about how they, you know, armed the ATF and they call themselves a pro 2A company. And effectively, the guy slapped back and, and said, um, like, if we didn't have government contracts, then uh, civilians wouldn't be able to buy any of our products. It's like, well, I mean, we can't buy the products from you. We want anyway, but that's besides the point. And um, I thought there's just this complete disconnect between um, these massive companies and, and the community. I mean, like, of course, people will follow them and like appreciate their content, just pictures of guns. But there's there's no actual substance there. It's just, you know, guns and no actual real human stance. It's just, you know, spokesperson uh, platitudes that really don't do anything for us. Instead of people, you know, like, like yourself, you're, you're putting your, your brand on the line every time you make a point. And usually much to everyone's, you know, a pleasure because it it makes sense it's well well argued and all that stuff and um people people appreciate that they appreciate realness these days people don't want just the the corporate wall and you know put money in box receive item it's you guys are real and it's 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 so especially for, for our community it's so different because we're just used to big box brands you know and no real personable interaction at least in my experience yeah, and it's fun because I, I can see that and, and I can see what other companies have done well and I can see what they haven't done well. And one of the things that I think they haven't done well uh, among many is, you know, they just everything is too sanitized and there's no point. And I mean, if you're selling um, AR-15s and, and, you know, you've never sat down for one moment and considered that people might actually have to use those against a tyrannical government, then I would say, why are you in this industry? Like you could be selling anything. Um, yeah. if, you know, firearms aren't a particularly high margin item. So, you know, I feel like at least for me personally, to be in this industry the way that I am, I, I want to be immersed and I want to understand it. And we make fun of everybody. I mean, if you look through our Twitter feed, especially, I mean, we make fun of revolver shooters. We make fun of um, you know, AK guys, we make fun of AR guys, FUDs, boomers, millennials. I mean, just about everybody. And, and all of those are things that I've personally seen or experienced, um, you know, people who think that they're going to be John Wick in a gunfight, but they've never trained. And, you know, they, their idea of training is going to the local indoor range every other month. And so there's, you know, certainly some shit posting and some trolling, but most of the time, even when we're trolling or shit posting, there's there's a nugget of truth or some kind of a gun truthism in there, and I think most people see it. Some people don't, and if they don't, then you know maybe we're not the company for them, or maybe they'll get it at some point in time and they'll come back and say, "Hey, that was actually pretty damn funny." Yeah, yeah. Um, do, do you think it's do you think it's strange that a a presence like yours is so rare? Um. Yeah, I, I do, um, for a few reasons. Number one, we're a small company, so we can kind of do what we want. I mean, in reality, I'm the one making the decisions on what gets posted. And, um, you know, those my guys in the back are doing their job. My brother's managing the shop, and he's got plenty of things uh, going on. Uh, but most companies are just too big, and, and they're, they're too unwilling to take those kinds of risks because – they don't really understand how to gain on the upside. So there's a lot of companies that just simply don't really understand 
what to do with their social media accounts. So, and that's because the company's been around for a while, run by older people, and it's just not really their scene. I mean, I'm not all that. I'm, I'm 35, so I'm sort of at the top end of the millennial spectrum. But I can I can see the growth of social media and online presence and how important it is. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of other companies that if they tried to talk that way, they would get called out by people for all of the things that they do in reality that are contrary to that. You know, um, Springfield Armory took a lot of crap for uh, what they tried to do in Illinois, trying to make it harder for um, FFLs to get licenses. And, you know, Daniel Defense had some issues. Um, You know, uh, Accuracy International is... um, not a very pro gun company, to be honest, you know, so I kind of looked at like Barrett, you know, Barrett stopped selling their rifles to law enforcement in California and New York when those states passed laws that civilians couldn't own them. So I thought, OK, well, that's like the one company that seems like they 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 give less fucks than everyone else. So let me try to do a little bit of that and see where it goes. But, yeah, it's unfortunate that it's it's very rare. I think people are just afraid to make a decision that's going to impact their bottom line. Um, and they haven't built their company in a way that, that they can afford to, to do it, it because it probably will affect their bottom line. And we're just fortunate enough that, you know, I, I didn't plan it that way in particular, but it just kind of worked out that way. So. Yeah. Did, were you guys, uh, were you guys making like edgier posts before the ammo shortage? Cause I, I, I feel the, the ammo shortage has given, you know, people who can really keep up with, uh, supply and demand, and, and it's a fucking challenge, I'm sure. But at, at least you guys have something to put on the shelf, you know, every month. Um, but has that given you more freedom with your posting, or or were you already uh, doing that kind of thing before? The, uh, sure, uh, we were definitely doing some of that before the pandemic. I mean, we we were, you know, we were dropping the the big igloo memes back oh, in. Yeah. I don't know, September of 2019. And and, I mean, you know, it had been that had been a thing for years, even prior to that. So it's not like we were the first people to start. But yeah, we were we were getting, you know, pretty heavy into the and and then so that kind of started in September of of 2019. And then as we got into October, November, you had uh, the proposed um, gun bans in in Virginia that were going on, so we started marketing pretty hard uh, to those people. We excuse me, uh, we offered free shipping to Virginia for like two months, and got a whole big customer That's base. Why I there. Of you because of that. Yeah, so we got a lot of exposure there, uh, and then as time went on, um, you know, it, it just seemed obvious that things, as we got into the beginnings of the pandemic, and you've got people telling you that states are declaring martial law and and everybody's rushing out to buy toilet paper and masks. And it's like, wow, this is, this is like kind of interesting. I'm not really sure what's going on here, but it seems pretty wild. Like people are now buying guns like crazy, ammo like crazy. Like let's, let's just keep, you know, let's see what's going on. And uh, then as we got into the summer with the riots and George Floyd and, and all this stuff, um, yeah, by that point we were, we were having a lot of fun with it and we had, uh, the, the, the trace, which is a anti-gun website run by Bloomberg money that they try to disguise by calling it something else. Um, they wrote a kind of a hit piece about us, about how we were, we were single-handedly arming the, the Boogaloo movement and oh my God. all this stuff. And so that got us banned on, on, uh, Instagram and, and on Facebook and, that's when I really started to go more into Twitter. I, I really didn't use Twitter for much before that, but now it's uh, like my only lifeline to the world. So I, that's, I'm, that's I'm, the exact same thing with me. <laughs> banned yeah. on banned on Instagram multiple times. Now I'm now I'm a, a Twitter refugee. Yeah. Um, so uh, f- from there, I mean, uh, after the Bulu kind of started to fade and. Um, I, I guess this thing carried on. How have you guys been able to? Uh, so, some of the, some of the most people won't know is uh, if they haven't checked out your site yet. Is uh, your your ammo is still affordable? It's not through the roof. You know, doing some cheaper than dirt bullshit. You guys are supplying people as you can at you know uh, fair prices. Yeah, we're trying to keep things reasonable. You know, 
um, material cost has gone up across the board for all the materials that we use. Uh, shipping, uh, like freight, in, for example, freight in particular has basically doubled. So we're paying double to ship a pallet of bullets from our bullet manufacturer to us uh, than we were prior to the pandemic. So, I mean, pricing is up across the board, but, you know, we're, we're trying to be reasonable. We, we made some good investments in our equipment and our process uh, before the pandemic and early on in the pandemic. So we've, we've gotten faster and more efficient uh, since the beginning of 2020, for sure. And we have a lot more planned for this year. So we tried to invest smartly. Um, we tried to use this as a chance to build our manufacturing process out the way that we want it to keep quality the way that we want it as volume increases, uh, which is something a lot of small businesses struggle with. So, um, yeah, we've, as a result, we've been able to keep pricing closer to, you know, as close to normal as we can, we can do it. Um, most of our products use remanufactured brass and we've got a very good process for that. Uh, we've, we consider ourselves some of the experts in the world with it. So we've been able to keep costs down a little bit over new brass ammo and have it be every bit as reliable and, and better in a lot of ways. So we're, we're doing the best we can. And uh, unfortunately, the situation with the supply chain just really hasn't gotten any better. Um, primers are still very hard to get. And when you can get them, they're at ridiculous prices. And um, you just kind of have to take it as it comes and be willing to pay a lot more for something than you think you should have to. But that's that keeps your machines running and it keeps your people paid and it keeps them happy then that's what you've got to do. So uh, that's basically where we're at. Yeah. So is, is it the primer? Is it just that primer production like worldwide is the, the bottleneck for this whole thing? Yeah. For the ammo shortage? Yep. So, you know, we, we, this is a challenging industry for a couple reasons. The first is uh, you can't just get into the business of making primers when you see there's a shortage. Uh, like everybody got into making masks. So um, primers, the, the, the compound that, uh, the, the priming compound inside of a primer is a fairly sensitive explosive. So it has to be mixed out of the component chemicals on site. So that requires real science, laboratories, you know, people with PhDs and, and stuff like that. Um, the chemicals are controlled. Um the amount of it that you store on site is such that, you know, you could really blow up a sizable area. So you've got to locate that plant in the middle of nowhere. The equipment's expensive. So this industry is very cyclical. It kind of goes up and down on a four-year cycle at most, but really a two-year cycle because we've got midterm elections. So it's tough for companies to make big capital investments and be assured that they're going to get a good return on investment. That's basically what why Remington declared bank. One of the reasons Remington declared bankruptcy uh, was, you know, they made sizable investments, believing that Hillary was going to get elected in 2016. She didn't, and for the first two years of the Trump presidency, the gun market was dog shit, and they couldn't pay the notes on on the loans that they made to try to bolster their. I mean, they they made a if Hillary would have won, they would have made a great bet. Problem is, she didn't, so they made a bad bet. So. That's really what it comes down to. Every time we have one of these crunches, primers is always the problem. But there's only four companies in the U.S. that actually make primers. And um, they're very hesitant to invest more to increase capacity. And it's very tough to start a brand new primer company from scratch. So you have a couple of overseas manufacturers. Um, they're pretty taxed right now as well. And small companies don't really know and don't have the resources to work with them. You know, if you're bringing in primers from overseas, you got to buy an entire shipping container for them to even talk to you and for it to make sense. So that's a pretty sizable outlay of cash. You're talking about 15 to 20 million primers and, um, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. You've got import permits. You got to work with the Department of State. You got to have a freight uh, customs broker. You got to know how to work with the company in that other country and they have to know how to work with their government. So it's a time consuming process and it's not something that you 
if you're a small business and you got to make ammo and you're the only guy uh, in the company, you just don't have the time. So um, we're working on that and, and we we think we're going to have some things lined up to be able to get uh, some of these primers from other countries. But even with us, it's taken many, many months even to get the documents arranged. And then there's production time, there's time in transit, all these things. So it's, uh, it's just a very difficult, it's, it's hard, it's hard to plan ahead and everybody else is in the same boat. So all these primer companies are getting 10,000 emails a day and you're one of 10,000. So if they didn't know who you were before the pandemic, they're not going to make a big effort to try to get to know you until after the pandemic. Damn. Yeah. I was wondering why in, uh, because I, I didn't quite know all that, um, as I'm sure many of our listeners wouldn't. I, I was wondering why every veteran who was running a, a T-shirt or coffee company wasn't like, hey, fuck it, I'll get into primers. But <laughs> when you need PhDs and a, a shack in the middle of the Mojave to, to get on with it, you can, you can understand. Yeah, I mean, like, um, it, and even even if you didn't need those things in particular, the the um, it's a scale problem, too. So CCI makes a billion primers a month. OK, that's 12, 12 billion primers a year. So I don't care what you're making. Making a billion a month of anything is really fucking hard. So, you know, it, it's just if making a billion pennies a month is a difficult task. So it's just it's very, very capital intensive. And it, the equipment, it, it takes a long time to build. It's all very special. You can't just call up an automation company and order yourself a small pistol primer manufacturing line and have it show up. Um, you know, we live in this like just in time Amazon economy where people think that people don't, I, I think uh, starting with the millennial generation and going backward, I think people really have very little understanding of manufacturing in general. Um, but Definitely not when it comes to complex products and products that are made in very high volume. I think most people just have absolutely no idea how that works. Dude, if oh, yeah. you want to move one machine to the other side of your factory, it's 10000 and up. Like sure. If you're paying contractors and stuff, you got a big machine, you're like, oh, I'm moving some stuff around. It's like drop ten grand just to move something. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, and you hopefully where you're moving it to in the plant has the proper foundation. You know, some of these big presses, you got to pour a brand new foundation for the thing to sit on. It's got to have a, you know, a service area underneath. It's, it's a real right. undertaking, you, you know, electrical. down the road. You need the um, electrical run to it. You need the air. Yeah. If it takes water. Sure. Cool. Um, what, one of my first experiences in the gun community, I, wor I worked for an insurance company for 10 years and I worked exclusively with manufacturing companies and down the road, about 20 minutes from here, 15, 20 minutes is one of the, one of the four or five forging operations in the, in the U S that makes the up forges upper and lower receivers. So if you, if you have an AR rifle that has an upper that has a little square, right uh, near where the forward assist is, uh, stamped into it or forged into it. Those are forged in a plant here in Ferndale, Michigan. And I worked with them, uh, before I started this company. So I got to understand, you know, that was it, during the peak of the Sandy Hook buying spree. So these guys were made, I mean, they had literally crates of upper and lower forged blanks. As far as the eye can see, it was insane. And now they bought a much, they're, they're in a 200,000 square foot building. These presses are 15 or 20 feet tall and they've got, they cost a million bucks each and they've got, you know, 15 of them they've acquired over the years. They do their own heat treating in house. Now that probably, it probably costs three, $4 million to put in that heat treating line. I mean, it's no joke. So, um, I think people just don't really understand, uh, you know, we, we live in, and again, 3D printing is great, but it's like people look at this 3D printer and they think like, oh, we're only a few years away from having like Star Trek replicators in our house. It's like, God, you guys, you, you know, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But it, no, dude, if a machine costs a million bucks, it costs at least a million to have it installed. Sure. Yep. 
that's that's Gardner about what it is. Thing? Yep. Yeah. Damn. I mean, for, for those that uh, for those that don't know, the ambient noise in the background is the Phoenix Ammunition Plant uh, stamping and putting together new ammunition right now, right? Yep. Yeah, that sound you can probably hear. It's a clicking noise. That is one of our standalone priming machines. So we have machines that do nothing but put the primer in the case. That's the most difficult operation of the of the whole manufacturing process. So that's done on a separate piece of equipment. And then those primed cases are brought over to our loaders where uh, the powder and the projectile is, is put into place. And then it goes over to our, our quality inspection and, and packaging area. Plus that, plus that process. I've got 250 rounds of nine mil heading from uh, from you guys right now. So, do oh, it, do dude, it. You, you must have been on it. I, I can't buy ammo from them. Uh, I'm the meme. Take my fucking money, please. <laughs> I just got into work and I was like, shit, it's 901, and my alarm hadn't gone off. It's on. always five minutes, and I'm like, sold out. Yeah, I, I I got on and I was amazed that there was any left because usually if it's it's 901, I'm like, ah, we're too late. Gone. But. No, I really was... liked the meme you guys posted where it's like fish and somebody threw something in the water and like oh, yeah. half the fish like yeah, it. I think you guys should be charging more. <laughs> I might be able to buy some ammo. Yeah, I mean it's it's been pretty pretty wild. You know, the commodity stuff goes very, very quickly. Some of the more expensive ammo takes a little while to sell, but I mean, you know, we we tell people when we're gonna post it up and Oh, I no, always, you do. Totally. I always check our Google Analytics uh, five minutes before we do a, an inventory update. And there are times where we've got two or 3,000 people camped out on the website hitting refresh <laughs> and waiting for it to happen. And, you know, if we put out, say, 300,000 rounds, our average order right now is about 500 rounds. And so that means, you know, that's about 600 customers. So if you've got 2,000 people on the website before the inventory is even updated, you know, only a third of those people are even going to get something anyway, not to mention all the people who come there at, you know, like you said, 901 or 1001 or 1005. The laws of economics say you that's right. charging more. And, and we're, we're trying to be as fair as we can. I mean, you know, we, no, we appreciate it. Look, this, is, this is when the batches are going to come up. It's first come, first serve. We don't, we're, you know, we're not Ticketmaster. I, I don't have, I don't have a million dollars to pay somebody to code this website to make it such that, you know, you put an item in your cart and you've got two minutes and forty seconds to check out. Like we just, this is, this whole rush has been pretty wild, and we're trying to, to manage it day by day. But it's difficult for a small company that doesn't have a lot of those resources to come up with things on the fly. Uh, in a timely manner and in an affordable manner, you know, for a while, uh, I mean, we have, we have a backup website we built on a separate platform because we were, we were 99% sure that Shopify was going to kick us off when we started getting, you know, hit pieces written about us and things like yeah. that. So that was my first priority was if they, if I wake up one morning and my website is literally turned off, like it's parlor or something but uh, we have to have a backup plan and, and that costs money. So yeah. there's, there's a lot to it that people, you know, I, I understand it's frustrating for some folks, like, believe me, I, you know, shit, I, I ordered stuff from cheaper than dirt during the Sandy hook craze. And, you know, I've got 300 P mags in a trunk in my closet that I'm embarrassed to say what I paid for them. So, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. And it, unfortunately, we just the market is so unsteady and the demand is so high that we just don't really have a way to do it any better than what we're doing now and we think it's it's at least manageable for most yeah i, I think it's as fair as it comes when you learn about uh I mean, I mean you guys will announce it the day before and then you learn about it from some meme and you're like oh shit no i gotta get on it <laughs> yeah. that's what else can you do and um, has, has your site been crashed? I was surprised it hadn't gone down the, the few times I've ordered so far. Um, no, it's never crashed. I mean, Shopify is a is a pretty big, they're, they're probably the biggest e-commerce provider. So, it, you know, I, I, I don't even actually know like how much site traffic we 
get allocated, I guess would be the word, or, or how much it would take to break our website. I suppose I should know that, but I don't. <laughs> but at this point, I mean, you know, we're we're doing well for ourselves, and and we have a lot of customers in my little corner of the world. But again, we're a niche. I mean, you know, if we've got if we've got ninety thousand email addresses in our email list, then you know, uh, there are companies on Shopify that probably have 9 million email addresses. So sure. I, I, I'm sure that they're capable of handling those people. And um, I believe that, I, I don't think that that should ever be an issue. It's never happened. So uh, that's, cross that's the good. Fingers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, ordering from um, T-Rex Arm recently, they, they put on a sale uh, a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of plate carriers and oh my god this site was destroyed like overnight and you know, they're they're a pretty sizable company themselves these days and and very very tech forward and and still this site was managed to be crashed so i, I was just impressed uh but I, I guess uh maybe they have some independent thing that's not quite uh not quite shopify or something but uh, yeah i don't know what platform they use everybody's a little bit different depends if they host it themselves, uh, all those things. Yeah, I, I think they might maybe to, to avoid the whole thing you were talking about with being, you know, potentially kicked off overnight. But I mean, as long as it's working. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, you know, I would say the most frustrating part of this whole situation is we, we did spend a lot of time really understanding the competitive shooting marketplace and doing our best to make products specifically for that market. And learning the, the players. I personally do a lot of competitive shooting and I did that to try to learn the market. And now it's actually something I, I really enjoy. Um, but the competitive shooting matches that I've attended so far this uh, spring are markedly down. I mean, we, we had uh, a local club, a three gun uh, club that shoots three gun and they would sell out all 130 spots in a matter of five minutes every month consistently and last time I looked, uh, they had maybe 35 to 40 shooters, which is like unbelievable on a Sunday shoot. And it's just because people can't get ammo. And especially with three gun, you got to get three different kinds, four different kinds. So it's tough to design matches around a very restricted round count. Um, or it's, I mean, if you don't have any bird shot, you can't shoot three gun. You don't got any nine mil, you can't shoot three gun. So it sucks because... I really like that part of the market. And I think those guys are some of the best trained. Um, they're some of the people who I would say are some of the best representatives of the community. Um, so all that's great. But if they can't get ammo to shoot, then it, it kills the market and it shrinks the market when it should be growing. And, yeah. you know, that's the real, that's the real, sucky part is we i just don't have a way to make sure that those guys get what they need without being picky and choosy and trying to play favorites and it's just too much to manage yeah it's it's, it's a very strange time for this community because there's so much potential for growth except for the, the ammo shortage i mean there's so many potential new shooters and people into it for all sorts of different reasons whether it be you know rights or self-defense or sport and and the the damn problem is we can't shoot <laughs> yeah we um we have a local training company here in michigan called mdfi michigan defensive firearms institute i've been training with them for years i've taken uh, probably a hundred hours of firearms training uh through their company various aspects all the way from taking beginner classes with my wife up to uh, two weekends ago, I was out with a buddy of mine doing a, a night class with our uh, with our night vision on. So we were out shooting at three in the morning, you know, in complete darkness. And uh, I told them at the beginning of the season, I said, I want to make sure that you, you know, I, I understand that if your potential customers can't get ammo, you won't be able to sell training classes. And that's bad for everybody. So we worked out a deal with them so that if you sign up for one of their classes, uh, you can, you are guaranteed ammo for that class. And we've already shipped them what we think they'll need for the year. And we have a backup plan. Uh, we have where we have extra if they need more. And we were really happy to do that because again, I, you know, I would rather our ammo be going down the pipe of somebody that just bought a Glock 19 and wants to know 
how to clear their bedroom without pointing a gun at their wife or kid in the middle of a fucking hallway because the idiot at the gun store said, well, these night sights are good. You don't need a weapon light. You don't need a flashlight. Just, you know, line up the three glowing dots and fire away in the dark. So Astoria style. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, right. Uh, and it, that shit happens, you know, once a month, it seems like if you look around. So, you know, yeah, we ended up, you know, obviously cutting a deal with them. And, and from a revenue standpoint, might not have been the best for us. But from the value standpoint, I really I, I really wanted to make sure that we could do everything we could. You know, there's a lot of good firearms training companies around and I wish I could supply all of them. I've trained with a lot of them. And um, that that's one thing we tried to do this year, um, aside from focusing on direct to retail, was trying to make sure that we get ammo to people who are going to do uh, training classes because I personally find them to be very valuable and, and super important and something that the community doesn't focus on enough, I think. Yeah, I I, I do think the, the culture is thankfully shifting that way. But um, yeah, that's that's so yeah, would, that's so important um, instead of instead of chucking another, you know, 500,000 rounds on the on the stockpile for some guy that shoots once a year, maybe. Well, right, that's amazing. Go, go all the Gucci kit. Uh, it's going down <laughs> new shooters who are, you know, they want to know how to how to take care of themselves. Well, I, I know people that didn't sign up for courses because they couldn't guarantee they'd have the ammo for them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so right amazing. now, uh, to my knowledge, I think there's only maybe two or three training. I think Haley Strategic has a, a ammo program of some kind. And I think there might be like one other that I, I know of in terms of like big name companies. But yeah, I mean, I, I you know, we were talking with Cogworks. Um, you know, there's a lot of Fieldcraft Survival. There's a lot of good companies out there. And um, yeah, if you don't have the ammo, you can't train. And unfortunately, that's tough for their business at a time where it should be off the charts. Yeah, seriously. Um, speaking of keeping things running, um, so obviously we, we talked about the 3D, uh, 3D printing gun community. And of course, with the shortage, when you're making new prototypes, it's kind of hard to, uh, to tell if it's a functioning gun or a paperweight. But uh, you've been involved with a few, a few friends of ours, Control Pew, Ivan, uh, I'm sure maybe more. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Phoenix Ammunition's involvement with the 3D printing gun community? Yeah, so I, you know, I've been interested in um, sort of the homemade firearms world for years. Uh, I, I was super interested in Cody Wilson and Defense Distributed and the stuff that he was doing years ago um, back with 80 percenters and the Ghost Gunner. So I, I, I have a Ghost Gunner. I, I've played around with it a lot. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, and then, of course, you know, you're, you're kind of getting into the next iteration, uh, which is 3D printing. And so the 3D printing has made a lot of te technological strides in the last couple of years in particular. So um, we we got into it initially as just, hey, let's let's supply some ammo to these guys um, to help them to help offset their development cost because you know they're really starting to come up with some scratch designs some really cool things uh we have a 3d printer now ourselves that we've played with quite a bit um we've tried to proof test some of their designs we've got a printer that uses a really nice material so we've we have a manufacturing license and an sot license uh so we've played with some suppressor designs and and uh 3d printed lowers and tested some some different things out and tried to be as useful as we can be we're i'm not a designer i don't have the ability to do that so i wanted to make sure that those guys who do have those talents aren't limited by not being able to afford ammo or not being able to get it especially right now so we said hey look you guys you know promote us as best you can we appreciate it but in the end uh we just love to see you continuing to do what you do and um so far it's been a pretty you know i just reached out on them through social media and um we had some friends in common as well they've got people doing development all over the country they had one guy who was doing some designs that lived maybe five to ten minutes away from here so it oh, just nice. it, it's a smaller it's a it's a pretty tightly knit community at least the guys who are good at it uh and are and are really making the the progress 
So um, it was pretty easy. Once you get connected to one, you can kind of see the landscape and um, figure out who's good and who's bad and who, who needs help and who doesn't and figure out what you can do for them. Yeah, that's 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 massive. I mean, seeing just the innovation they've they've achieved in a few short years. I mean, we went from uh, like maybe ARs will be possible in the future, and just still admiring the Liberator. And next thing you know, I mean, all sorts of nine mil sub guns and ARs you can do push ups on. It's it's incredible. And I mean, just as, as our technology improves, uh, you know, can't stop the signal. Gun control truly is dead, one way or another. Um, we just have to have to make sure those designs get stronger and stronger and more and more refined and uh, more and more years ahead of the, you know, the status quo, what they're trying to do to, to stop it. Yeah. I mean, really, you know, people, the, the second amendment, I've said this before and some people disagree with it or, or they, they're not sure where I'm getting at, but the second amendment really, when you look at the core of it um, is, is about protecting human innovation, specifically toward the, you know, self-defense industry. I, I would, I would tailor it, I guess, if you want to be reductive, but it's about protecting the ability for human beings to innovate and invent and uh, move forward with technology. So um, if you, if you, um, as technology improves, we're going to have better and better ways of killing each other, to put it bluntly. I mean, we, you know, go back to the caveman days. Who ruled the caveman world? The biggest and strongest caveman, because he could kill anybody with his bare hands, which was risky, of course. But so eventually, you know, the, the smaller caveman got sick of getting beat, beaten up. So he picked up a rock and he whacked the big guy over the head with it. And he thought, shit, that worked pretty well. Uh, so then he got a bigger rock and then he shaped it and then he made a rock that he could throw so he didn't have to get so close and then he sharpened the rock and then put the rock on the end of a spear and then you know bow and arrow etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's like guys this whole like you guys are so enamored with getting caught up in this oh we got to ban bump stocks or adjustable stocks or muzzle brakes or you know the thing that goes up or 30 round flips and, you know, for all we know, tomorrow, Elon Musk, after he gets done tanking Bitcoin, is going to come out and say, hey, I've got this solar powered laser gun that with, you know, infinite ammo that recharges itself every night. It's fully carbon neutral. And oh, by the way, none of the current gun laws will apply to this thing because it doesn't shoot a projectile. It shoots a beam of light or whatever. And so then what do you do? Like, are you going to tell him he can't sell that thing? Or are you going to try to rewrite all of, you know, the entirety of uh, firearms regulation just to try to regulate this one thing? It's crazy. So, you know, this, all these conversations are, are just about tr the government desperately trying to keep people from thinking. And as we know, that just doesn't work. Just doesn't work. As much as they try to curb it with public school, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, anybody with an engineering degree, or anybody who's worked in a science in a, in a in a machine shop with a CNC for five or ten years could make a firearm easily with you know a basic manual bridge port or a drill in their garage. It just you know. Interesting. Yeah, Lucy. <laughs> and, and now, and as technology, just made it better. I'm sorry. It's so easy. I said 3D printers just made it better. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just like you know, 10 years ago, very few people had a 60-inch plasma screen TV on their wall because they were six grand. Nowadays, you can go to Costco and get one for 600 bucks. That's what 3D printing is. I remember seeing 3D printers in manufacturing companies six, seven years ago. They were huge. Uh, they didn't print stuff very well. Uh, they weren't functional parts. But now you can get one that's the size of a microwave that can print a functional part. Uh, Dude, I still wanted one of them big ones and I couldn't afford it. <laughs> like when I found out they're 200 bucks, I'm like, I, I need like three or four. Like, yeah, you can get a Ender 3 that you can print a Glock 19 lower with all set up and ready to go for, you know, six, seven hundred bucks. Dude, so no, no, eventually, no, no. you can get an Ender 3 for 
my last one was a hundred and sixty seven dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you can get them super cheap. You know, with a couple upgrades, maybe they're they're a little bit more. But I mean, eventually, you know, we'll we'll get into the realm where three D printing with metal is going to become that cheap. And people say, well, okay, yeah, but you don't have three phase power in your house. Blah blah blah. I mean, we'll figure that stuff out. And if things keep going the electric route, um, you know, you may. We may have a day where everybody's got three phase, two hundred amp power at their house anyway. So the only it's, reason it's, the only reason you don't have three phase power available at your house is because it's cheap. Because they sell by the amp, and three phase sure. power ta- is way cheaper, and they will not sell it to residential. Sure, That's you know uh, trivia. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, getting really nerdy here. Is there any, any other future projects you have coming up? Any any uh, focuses for Phoenix Ammunition going forward? Um, I would n- n- no no special projects in particular. Where I well we, we're looking into working on our own uh, defensive ammo projectile. Uh, that's been a problem for us this year. Uh, we used to use spear gold dot projectiles, but we can't get them anymore. They're too busy. So we're looking to develop our our own defensive bullet. Uh, pistol bullet first um, that'll be something that we're going to try to get done this year uh, we've worked with another company on some armor piercing but not officially classified as armor piercing projectiles Is uh, this atlas arms yeah atlas arms we've talked with them uh, we've got a design of our own as well that we've we've looked at doing um, so there's there's some interesting things there we may play with um but yeah those are really the two major things i would say in terms of projects uh just as far as other things we've got going on uh we sponsor our uh we sponsor a a annual women's shooting event up here in detroit that's run by a local group um this year we're hoping to have two thousand women in two days get some basic firearms instruction and have an opportunity to shoot and we sponsor all the ammo for that project and We've been doing that for three uh, years in a row now. Uh, we've tr- helped train more than 3,000 women total, uh, which is a, a, something that we really believe in. Um, you know, as far as what other people can do, you know, our, our customers or just people listening to the podcast, try. there's a couple of things that are very important to supporting the community going forward for future generations. The first is... If you're going to donate money to gun rights organizations, make sure that you donate to the people who are really doing the work and really have your best interest in mind for us. That is Firearms Policy Coalition and um, Gun Owners of America. Um, FPC, we've worked with them a lot. Uh, They're very much the same mindset that we are and uh, just a great, a great group to support. Um, very knowledgeable. I think at some point they'll probably overtake the NRA as the more prominent organization dollar and membership wise. Um, so whatever we can do to make that happen faster is good. And then also try to support your local outdoor shooting clubs. Uh, people forget about these places because you get an, especially up here in Michigan, it's, it's cold during the winter, of course. So people like to go shoot indoor, but these outdoor clubs, some of them have been around for a hundred years and you know, the problem is the cities have grown around them and that's when they start to get noise complaints and municipalities would love nothing more than to shut down those clubs and bulldoze it and, and, you know, put up a bunch of fucking McMansions or some crap for, you know, some local developer can get a side deal with the mayor. So even if you don't think you're going to use it all that much, a lot of them are very cheap. Um, I'm a member of like five outdoor shooting clubs here in the Southeast Michigan area. I really only shoot at two of them or three of them, I guess, but, uh, I want to make sure that they stay alive and it costs me like 200 bucks a year for each one. It's really not that much money. If you can only support one, only support one. Um, but you know, shooting outdoors is much better than shooting indoors. These clubs you know, a lot of them, you have a lot of flexibility. You got to bring your own targets, of course, but you, you know, you can find yourself a, a training bay and come up with whatever scenario you want. You can shoot from weird angles and practice defensive things up close, your draw stroke, all the kind of things that indoor ranges hate. 
So try to support local private shooting clubs. Some of them are going to have, you know, like an initiation or a, um, you know, you have to attend a board meeting once a year or something like that. Um, but it's really not all that hard. Uh, it, it, they're a lot of fun. Some of the best people that I have made friends with since starting this company are because of those clubs. And that helps sh- support the competitive shooting community, which a lot of companies like us um, not only rely on that market, but uh, it, those markets also produce a lot of innovation for the, the gun community. Uh, they're test beds for different firearm designs and different types of ammunition. So do your best to support outdoor clubs, uh, join Firearms Policy Coalition, and don't be afraid to argue with people. Um, you know, if you're not, not that I, I want you to ruin your Thanksgiving dinner, but, you know, if you're sitting around the table and uh, your brother, or your, your sister-in-law or somebody's talking a bunch of shit about guns, like you don't have to be com- combative about it, but challenge them. Like force force these people to quantify what they're talking about because the the real the, the truth of this is, and it's not really a secret if you spend any amount of time. The truth of the matter is, all of the statistical data is on our side of the fence, and for whatever reason, we still seem to be losing the major arguments uh, because we allow we have allowed the the gun debate to be an emotional one as opposed to one rooted in logic and statistics. But all of the data is on our side. So force people to, you know, talk numbers and state their claims and back up their position with real world information. And um, you probably won't change their mind, but you'll get better at refining those arguments so that eventually when you do approach somebody whose mind is willing to be changed, you'll be that much better prepared. Absolutely. I mean, it's real hard to argue with 500,000 to 3 million defensive gun uses every year. I mean, that's that's not a small amount of lives saved. Yep, it's not. Um, you know, the suicide debate is a joke and, and those statistics can be easily found and, and you, can, you can really trap people with their own logic uh, on that one as well. Um, you know, they love to use Australia as some kind of a role model for what we should do with guns. But um, Australia's suicide rate didn't change after they basically banned almost all guns. So the idea that that's going to, you know, meaningfully change the number of people that kill themselves here in the United States is is thoroughly debunked. It's the stupidest thing that they can say, but they do it because nobody wants to talk about that Uh but of course they're also the party of assisted suicide. So it's like, what, you know, how, how are we having this conversation? But not, not to get too far off in the weeds, but yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, of, uh, discussion to be had in, on that topic as well. Absolutely. All right. Um, do anyone else have any more questions before we end or I do really quick. I don't want to keep you much longer. Oh, no, um, go ahead. First, I want to say you've been an amazing guest. Sometimes it's like pulling information out of people is very hard, but you've had so much great stuff to say. Um, Earlier, you mentioned that you were a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I have a few questions. Um, I was listening to the podcast, Paul's to the Wall, the other day, and they were talking about how they think that um, the – BJJ gym is like a breeding ground for sort of like anarchist ideas. And I wanted to know what you thought about that. A breeding ground for anarchist ideas. Um, (laughs) Well, I'll say this. Um, So obviously here in Michigan in the Midwest, it it might be a little bit different than it is at a BJJ school in say California. Um, I've trained in other States and other schools. And so I, I kind of have a broad aspect of, I've, I've competed across the country, um, you know, world championships and what have you. So I, I kind of have a pretty, I, I've got a pretty good, pretty good beat on the community. It's very diverse. Um, you would think that it's would be entirely like conservatives and, and cops, but it's not. There's a lot of real nerdy uh, people. There's a plenty of people on the, on the, the liberal end of the spectrum, but I would say, for the most part, I would describe it as more 
classic liberal slash libertarian. I don't know that I would say anarchist uh, is how I would describe the BJJ. <laughs> if I had to, if I had to peg their politics, if I had to only describe their politics with one word, I would probably pick classically liberal or libertarian. Um, that might be different depending on you know if you're at Eddie Bravo's gym where you know they're smoking weed and doing no gi like yeah that's probably going to be a little more anarchy than it is at a more formal uh, gym where they've got a bit more tradition and um, formality things like that but um, it's a pretty diverse community a uh, lot of lot of good shooters um, but a lot, a lot of people that I've had some pretty some pretty stiff political and, and gun debates with because they were, they just couldn't understand it. And that's tough for me because it's like, well, you know, so you're here basically to learn. I mean, let's, again, let's not like beat around the bush. You're here to learn something that's specifically designed for you to kill another human being with your bare hands. And you don't seem to think that's a problem, but God forbid I pull out my Glock and, and ventilate some guy who's trying to like break in my house. You think that's the worst thing in the world. But like if I choke this guy to death in my kitchen, like some kind of Jason Bork movie <laughs> where he's spraying blood out of his mouth and like shit's getting knocked off the walls. Like you tell me what's more traumatic. I mean, I, I have choked somebody unconscious before. Like it, it didn't feel great. Like if that person would have been dead, I would have been just as traumatized as if I stabbed him or shot him or beat him to death with a baseball bat. So I don't know why you think that you're on some kind of higher moral plane because you, you know, choke people until their brain doesn't have enough blood to function. And, and I put a hole through their chest. Like, what's the difference? But Self-defense is self-defense. Correct. Whatever you, whatever you can figure out and whatever you're comfortable with, you know. That's right. Um, awesome. Any Any more questions before we head off? One last one. <laughs> I did want to know how long you have, uh, how long you've trained for. Uh, Jiu-jitsu. So yeah. um, I wrestled in middle school and high school, and then I, I walked onto the wrestling team uh, at Central Michigan University for a couple of years. Uh, so I was pretty into grappling, uh, got a li- little bit injured. Uh, so I moved on to judo because that's the next thing that they had at central Michigan, they had a judo club. So I did that for a few years. Then when I moved back home, um, there weren't, there there weren't any judo clubs around that were serious about competing and and really training the way I wanted to train. So I, I walked into uh, a local jujitsu gym and I've been doing that ever since. So that was 2000 summer of 2007. So I've been training, pretty solidly for about 14 years um maybe there was a few months of hiatus in there here and there but it took me 10 years to get my black belt um there was a time where i competed and I, I was doing a competition twice a month for a period of three or four years um so i was pretty serious into it for a, a long time and it, it's taught me a lot there's a lot of corollaries between training jujitsu and training with firearms, um, hand strength and, you know, focusing on what people are doing with their hands, things like that. So there's a lot of crossover. I would highly suggest anybody in the shooting community look into Brazilian jujitsu. Uh, it will make you a better shooter and it will make you a better person. So You might not have expected to talk about that, but there's like a small jujitsu listener base that we have that are going to be very thrilled. (laughs) Well, like I said, there's a lot of crossover. Um, There's a professional firearms instructor called um, Scott Jedlinski, Modern Samurai Project is his company. And he's a purple belt, I believe. And and he's very uh, up on the, the, uh, the crossover skills between the two. Um, there's a, a black belt I know who shoots pretty good IDPA. I uh, used to know him a lot better when I was on Instagram, but it, it's been a little while, so I can't re- remember. Oh, uh, Cody Hudson is his name. Um, so there's there's a lot of guys who are getting pretty good at shooting who are also pretty good at jujitsu and vice versa. So I think that's going to be a growing part of, of the community um, going forward, and, and that's going to be great for both of those communities. Yeah, I'm I'm very hopeful for uh for just the shooting community. I, I feel like this younger, more self-defense oriented group 
uh, really taking that stuff a lot more seriously than the uh, the dying off FUD generation with six shooters and yeah, <laughs> all, all of that business. And, People, you know, I, I'm part of that generation. My my parents didn't yeah. hunt. Uh, you know, they weren't anti gun by any means, but we just didn't really have any guns. It wasn't of interest to my parents all that much um, initially, and then. As I grew up, I got more and more interested, but it was all from a defensive perspective. I never really yeah. thought about, not that I wouldn't hunt, but just wasn't something I did. So that's the new, the, the new generation is AR-15s, uh, you know, uh, red dots on pistols, self-defense, room clearing, taking training yeah. classes, you know, Garand Thumb, that type of stuff. That is the new community. And that's what works really well with um bjj and and uh grappling weightlifting same thing uh you know crossfit um not that crossfit is weightlifting uh don't send me any emails crossfit people <laughs> you know what you do it's not weightlifting um but you get the idea there's there's a lot of good crossover and and it's just going to make a great community overall with some really well-trained people and really well very capable self-reliant independent people Absolutely, I'm I'm very very optimistic for uh, for this community. Despite the climate, um, I think we got we got all the right tools and all the right um, ideas. So yeah, it's been uh it's been great talking to you, man. It's been very been like a very uplifting conversation. I feel like we got we got good people in our corner, good people who know what the fuck they're talking about, who are doing the right thing and um are building things to tear th things down. You know. Yeah, that's that's the, that's the goal. I'm very excited to release this episode. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Hey, no problem, guys. Anytime. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time.